We are back with another edition of What's Next, Living Longer, Better, Smarter. Today, what you should know about healthcare changes coming for older adults. This episode is made possible by Get Set Up, empowering older adults by providing them with the skills, opportunities, confidence, and connections to lead fulfilling and healthy lives. It is the fastest growing learning and discovery platform offering diverse programming that covers more than 5,000 topics while addressing digital and health literacy. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Mary Furlong. Hi, Mary. Hope you're having a great summer. Well, the heat is on, that's for sure. Uh, I'm really looking forward to today's episode, helping everyone stay up to date on the latest information when it comes to their health care. And we have two people here that can really help with that. First, Anna Hanshoot, principal at Cat5 Strategies, uh, a really sought after speaker on the subject with expertise in quality, care management, benefits, and more. She also serves on the board of RISE, the Resource Initiative and Society for Education. Hi, Anna. Hi, Fred. Hi, Mary. Hi, Lawrence. Thanks for having me. But also with us is Lawrence Kosick the visionary co-founder of Get Set Up, a virtual platform for live interactive classes designed for older adults. Great to see you again, Lawrence. Fred, Barry, it's Anna, it's uh, it's great to be here. I'm not sure about the visionary part, but I'll do what I can to, to, to live up to the description. You truly are a visionary. So Lawrence and Anna, thank you for taking time to join us on this podcast. The work you're both doing is so important. Anna, there are some changes with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid at CMS. First, let's describe for everyone what CMS is and the critical role it plays in the delivery of health care. Absolutely. So let's level set with everyone on what is CMS. CMS, like you said, Mary, stands for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. They are the payer for our healthcare system that takes care of people who are 65 plus or who qualify for Medicare by virtue of a disability. And so folks can qualify via age or via disability. So if you've received a paycheck anytime in your life, you normally see that there's some monies missing from your wage, right? And part of those monies go to fund the Medicare Trust Fund. And the monies from the Medicare Trust Fund are used to cover this health insurance program uh, for people who qualify for Medicare primarily uh, by virtue of age. So the program has been in place for many, many decades, and it has evolved as um, as time goes on, it has evolved. And what we see now is that most Medicare beneficiaries are in a value-based arrangement via a Medicare Advantage plan. So Medicare Advantage is a term that everybody should be familiar with in the space. Not only people that provide care providers um, or people that invest in the space or vendors that serve people in the space, but also consumers. Consumers should be really aware of the choices that they have for Medicare Advantage. So what is Medicare Advantage? Uh, Medicare Advantage are private companies that are paid for by CMS to administer Medicare benefits. And so they have to offer not only the original Medicare benefits that are commonly known, but they also have to offer um, extra, or most of them offer extra benefits beyond what original Medicare covers. And a lot of them offer Part D or drug coverage as well. So I think that kind of gives a little bit of a well-rounded picture of what CMS is and all of the different ways or the various ways or the two main ways really that they're paying for people's health coverage. So why is it important for people to be aware of CMS and the role that they're playing? Because you have a lot of baby boomers now that are in Medicare, correct? 
Absolutely. So the baby boomers have been aging into Medicare and we've seen this big bolus of baby boomers. So I know a lot of companies whose investment strategies is they follow the baby boomers. So when baby boomers were buying, you know, McDonald's and fast food for their kids as they were aging, they were investing there. And as they were earning more wealth, they were investing in bigger restaurant chains or, you know, fancy restaurant chains. And now they're investing in, in health tech as baby boomers age into the space and want to age at home and, and uh, those types of things. So why should we be aware of what CMS does and what CMS is doing is because it affects all of us, right? Whether it affects us because we're Medicare age um, or it might affect our parents or our grandparents, it's really important to know what's coming so that we can be educated consumers of healthcare educated investors in healthcare, educated service providers in healthcare, and that we can be prepared not only for what's happening today, but what's going to happen next year, three years from now, 10 years from now. What are the strategies that CMS is putting in place that are going to affect all of us that have to live in the ecosystem? Well, I think we should dive into that. What what are some of these changes on the way and, and how might they affect all of us with with healthcare plans. So I see mainly six things that are going to affect us, and we can dive a little bit deeper into some of them. And we see those six things showing up in all of these different policy decisions that CMS is making. And we see that also it should be noted across administrations. So we see some things that started with the Republican administration prior to this one and that have continued and evolved during this Democratic administration. And so these things where we see patterns are important to note because they're kind of administration proof, I think. And so they're good places to think about doubling down our investments or thinking about areas where it doesn't matter too much who's in the White House or who's in the administration because they're good places for us to put our investment in time, energy, money, et cetera. So what are those things? One is um, CMS is really looking at making sure that health plans and providers are ensuring timely access to care so that people get connected with the care they need when they need it. So that shows up in policies related to utilization management requirements. So we see in the news a lot, CMS taking a really close look at health plans that are using, let's say, artificial intelligence to deny care or tightening up utilization management requirements. The other areas we see are protecting beneficiaries via marketing requirements. So CMS taking a really close look at how are sales agents and health plans marketing their wares? Are they misleading beneficiaries? Is there a potential for people to misunderstand what types of plans they're signing up for? What types of drugs are available, what types of services are available. They're also strengthening via policy the quality infrastructure, meaning the star ratings program, how they pay providers, how they pay home health agencies, how they pay health plans. And they're making sure that the care that is delivered is patient-centered, takes into account the patient experience, that they're truly paying for quality as opposed to episodes, right? Like a per click, they went to the doctor, the doctor got paid. Now they're really looking at what outcomes did the individual get when they went to the doctor, right? Those types of things. Um, we see a lot of activity in advancing health equity. So they're pulling a lot of policy levers related to health equity, meaning they're looking at things like are there disparities based on social risk factors like race, ethnicity, low income, disability status? What are those disparities? How do we address those? 
they're pulling a lot of policy uh, levers related to behavioral health. How do we get more access to behavioral health physicians, nurses, specialists? What types of things can we do to require bigger networks, greater access via telehealth, for example, um, those types of things. And then finally, the big news was around the Inflation Reduction Act and the lowering of costs related to our drug costs, negotiation by Medicare on certain medications, um, forcing plans to pay a greater share of the bill related to Part D drugs versus what they used to pay before, what the beneficiaries were gonna pay. So those are all the six themes that I see that I know we are dying to <laughs> really dive a little bit deeper into some of those. But those are, the, those are the policy things that I see that CMS is pulling all of the levers at their disposal to forward. On that messaging front, uh, let me ask you, Anna, I mean, it can be very confusing, as as we all know, for, for consumers and deciding each year what kind of plan to go with. You know, there's so much on TV and the messaging can be confusing. And I guess the question at the heart of it all is if I'm getting all of these other benefits uh, thrown in food and transportation, the dental, the, the eyeglasses, everything, if that's all included in, a, in an advantage plan, Am I giving something up on the other end if I have a serious hospitalization? That's such a great question, Fred. So I always encourage my family members that come to me and say, hey, how do? what should I do? Should I join a Medicare Advantage plan? Which one should I join? What are the differences? So I always tell them, do not get distracted by the shiny objects that are going to be dangled in front of you like lots of supplemental benefits and think about your individual usage of your health plan, your historical usage and what you expect to happen, not only today, but for the rest of the year and moving forward with your health. So think about how did you consume health care and how do you like to be communicated with? So for example, are your doctors that you see and love and trust that you've been seeing for many years, are they on that health plan? Or could you go to any doctor? Do you need to be able to have the freedom to go to any physician that accepts Medicare? You may not care or you may not have a regular doctor that you see all the time, but you need to think through, if I get sick, let's say I get a serious illness like cancer, for example, am I going to want to be limited to where I go or am I okay having my health care managed by a group of doctors that is selected for me that I'm more limited? So you need to think about your preferences. If you're taking medications, you might say to yourself, are the medications that I'm taking on that health plan that I'm selecting? How are they covered? What tier are they? And when you think about that, you have to really look at, well, what does it mean to be a tier two or a tier three or a tier five? And think about, is it a set co-payment or is it a share of the cost? Because if it's a share of the cost, 30% of $10 is different than 30% of $500, right? And so you have to think through and apply the benefits that you see for the health plan to your specific situation. They may have a lot of shiny objects in the way of supplemental benefits, but they're not the things that are meaningful to you. Or there might be other things that are more meaningful to you, like choice of providers, like making sure your medicines are there, like making sure specialty coverage is done in a particular way, or if you don't have transportation, transportation may be important to you. Healthy foods may be important to you. So it's important to understand how to shop. Those are the main things, is knowing how to be a good 
consumer and how to make good choices because there's so many choices out there. They can be overwhelming. I get overwhelmed in the nail polish aisle at Walgreens, <laughs> right? So I can just imagine how someone who hasn't been taught how to shop for a health plan can, what a difficult time they must have making these types of decisions for themselves. So Lawrence, tell us about how Get Set Up and its wonderful programming will be affected. Well, there, there's clearly a big role for, for, for us and others to potentially play here, because if you if you listen to the the six major changes that Anna just described, um, there's a lot of things changing. And it means that there's uh, some new complication being introduced. And for for many of us, it's very hard to keep track of what our options might be, how to be a more informed consumer like Anna just recommended we all we all need to be because of the number of options. Um, you know, what are the things that we need to demystify for our learners so they understand what is part A and what is part B and what is Medicare Advantage and what are those differences and and how to shop for those and where are the the reliable you know sort of websites and digital tools that can be used to help them shop for these things. And so I think that um, you know U.S. healthcare is a is a very complicated and somewhat moving target, and anything I think we can do to help you know our older adult uh, learners understand what their options are, how to ask the right questions, how to advocate for themselves, um, you know how to learn what benefits they have, what they don't have, what's important. Um, I think that's an important role for us to play as an education platform. I agree with that. Um, maybe you want to comment about the focus on health equity and what that means. So health equity is important, um, and it, and it's increasingly becoming a a measure by which you know healthcare is assessed. But if you think about what health equity is, right? It's it's about accessibility, and it's about like the state in which everybody has a fair and just sort of opportunity to um, attain their best level of health, right? So that we all have equal opportunity. That that sounds good in theory, di difficult in practice, because we all have different sort of socioeconomic, you know, factors um, in our life. We live in different geographies, we have different incomes, we have different uh, uh, health situations, we have different, um, you know, family and community uh, situations. And so all of those things actually affect our ability to get you know, access to healthcare on a equal basis. So to the extent that we can level the playing field by helping uh, people use more digital tools, for example, if they live in a rural area or use telehealth, if they can't get to the doctor, um, maybe it's because uh, of mobility issues, maybe it's because they they, they live in, a, in, a, in an area in, in a rural community, um, maybe it's because they speak a different language uh, maybe it's because they lack some of the technical sophistication to, to learn how to use some of the apps and websites needed to access some of these things. Those are all equity, health equity issues for which education can help address and level the playing field. I love that CMS is now requiring health plans to come up with ways to offer digital health education to their members to make sure that they're able to uh, access medically necessary telehealth services. And I think that's such an important thing. And that I think is where you come in, right? Where the, the types of educational things that you put together for this population can really help to serve this strategy that health plans now have to come up with to educate their members about digital health. Yes, I, I, I completely agree with that because I think there's an opportunity um, on the learner side to provide sort of new education and programming that it helps folks understand what their options are. And then there's also an opportunity for us to work with the plans to help make more of their products, their services, uh, their information digitally available um, so that their members have more access to the information they need to live happy, healthy, more connected lives. So you work with health plans. I know you work with states, uh, some states as well, that are providing get set up services to, to older adults. 
yes, we work with the states, um, Health and Human Services, the Departments of Aging, uh, Medicare Advantage, and Medicaid. So um, all of those um, require some significant level of, of education. All of them are easier to access if you have some technical skill and you know what websites to go to and you're comfortable using your device. Um, so helping, helping folks understand at a base level, digital literacy and, and being able to use whatever device they have so that they can access their doctor, their care, their health plan website, um, you know, download PDF information around sort of their annual notices of change or their, the, the document that lists all their benefits, uh, being able to get that both in digital format uh, as well as, as by mail, I think is important because that's all part of health equity and making sure everybody has equal access to their information. And tell us about working with health plans, the efforts there. Uh, so it's a very important, that's a very important mission for us because, you know, health plans deliver health care to our older adults. And if you think of the, the most important things um, that we think about as we get older, you know, uh, our health, our finances, um, those are two of, of the most important things that we think about. And so health plans administer health and anything that we can do to help a health plan better serve their members is, is great for them and it's wonderful for the member. And because um, for all the reasons Anne articulated earlier, there's so much complexity and it's a moving target, um, understanding our current health coverage and anything that's potentially changing is critically important. It's critically important. So I think we can play a role both by helping educate the learner and working with the plans uh, to execute on their priorities and do a and help do a better job of making sure their their members, our learners, are completely in touch with with their plans and understand their benefits fully. And you've had a lot of impact in states like New York. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people whose lives have been touched by the training and the education. Yes, the states, the states have been, the states have been very important partners. And if you think about it, um, th there's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of connective tissue here because when we partner with um, a state, it's usually through health and human services, right? And that's a very big agency. And that's also where CMS sits, right? CMS is part of health and human services which is you know, where the Department of Aging is, Medicare, Medicaid. So it's very, very related. And so I think the states represented an entry point for us to, to help older adults initially with digital literacy. But what are the other things that they want to learn? Quite obviously, you know, how do I understand my, my health plan? What are my options? How do, I under, how do I learn how to use the apps the, the, the mobile apps, the websites, the member portals, the things that are really important in making sure that, that people are able to stay as healthy as they possibly can. So really, really interesting to, for us to have started working with the states, but ended up working also quite closely with Medicare, Medicaid, and Medicare Advantage. And, it, and that can mean a big difference to the bottom line and what people pay each month for drugs. And as they learn these skills, and how to analyze the costs. Um, so Anna, tell us what this will mean for the many, many people who will be making their healthcare plan choices once again for the coming year in just a short time. Are these choices going to be even more complicated? A hundred and million percent. <laughs> That's why we're doing this yes. podcast. <laughs> yes. yes. So if I were to say, if we were gonna do one thing, um, in this coming upcoming season. So right now we know that the costs uh, for your health, your share of costs for all of the different services and benefits that your health plan provides, those are baked through the end of the year. But in June of this year and, and a little bit into July, plans submitted their um, information, what their benefit design is going to be, they've submitted that to CMS. 
So they already know what the changes are going to be for January 1 of 2025. Everybody should be on the lookout in their mailbox or in whatever communication preference that they provided to their health plan. They need to be looking for an annual notice of change that is going to get to them before October 1. They should be very carefully looking at that because it's going to talk about all of the changes in the benefits. There are going to be some positive changes and there might be some negative changes. And it's really important to take a look at what were the changes so that you can say to yourself, self, <laughs> does this change affect me? Especially important where we already know we're going to see lots of changes because health plans are already telling us this, is in the formulary. The formulary is just a fancy word for drug list. So in the list of drugs that your health plan covers, expect to see more changes than you would usually see from year to year. So it's very important for you to take a look at what those changes are, make sure that they don't affect you. But if you do find that some of the changes affect you, don't worry, it's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean automatically you have to change your plan. There are many things you can do. One is you could see, look at the list and see if there are any alternatives there. So they may not cover your drug, but there might be formulary alternatives that are other drugs that you can take that will that are going to be on that list. So you can talk to your doctor about, hey, do any of these other drugs work in this therapeutic class? You can call the health plan up and say, hey, I noticed my drug's not going to be on there or now it's going to cost X. I don't want to pay that. And they'll go through all the options with you. So what are the options? The options are changing to another drug. Other options would be in advance of the new plan year, you can ask for an exception. So you could say, hey, I would like you to cover this drug at a lower cost, and they will make a decision. Most health plans will make a decision prior to the new plan year. Um, some will not, but they'll say, no, you got to wait till next year to get this decision. But many will make the decision prior to the new plan year. So if you can't get an exception, to the rules or to the new price, then you can actually go in and say, all right, I need to start shopping for a plan. Let me see where my drug is covered at a more favorable price that I'm willing to pay. So those are the types of activities that you need to do. A lot of people skip this step because let's face it, we all suffer from inertia, right? Like we're all like, oh, I'll do that tomorrow, I'll do that tomorrow. And then we run out of time to make the change. So there's a limited amount of time to change plans if you're already in one plan, limited amount of time at the end of the year to do that. So this year, it's more important than ever to pay attention to those documents, to know how the changes are going to affect you from a services or benefits perspective, but also from a drug coverage perspective. And then you can make decisions about what to do. A good thing to do is to contact your agent, your health insurance agent that helped you make a decision, they can actually walk you through these steps that I've been talking about. And you can really negotiate? Wow. <laughs> there is a process. So what's great about being in a Medicare Advantage plan is that you get all of the same protections and rights that original Medicare beneficiaries get. But you also get some additional things. And in this case, you get, there's an exception process that health plans have to go through. And so you can make an exception. So the types of time, the, the types of reasons why you may want to ask for an exception, it might be that your doctor thinks that there is no other drug on the drug list that's going to work as well for you as this particular drug. Or you've tried other drugs and they didn't work for you as well already. We know they didn't work yet as well. Or there might be other drugs that are lower cost, but your physician really recommends this one for you. And so in those cases, you could actually file for what's called a coverage uh, or an exception request. Or if they take your drug off the formulary, you could ask for it. 
for an exception for them to actually cover a formulary exception request. So there's lots of different exceptions that you can that you can ask for. So you're right, Fred. You can, in a way, that is a negotiation. Although you're not guaranteed, you have the right to make the request. And the health plan has to apply certain rules that Medicare puts in place, the CMS puts in place. They have to apply certain rules and treat everybody equally, apply the same rules to everybody. And if you're not successful, there's also an appeals process. And if you appeal, you can actually, um, your, your request goes to a third party who makes an independent decision. So really important protections for Medicare beneficiaries related to the Medicare Advantage program and related to how drugs are covered. Very important protections. I think where Lawrence comes in is he can actually teach people how to go through these processes because most people don't know they can do this. And there will be some improvements in lowering drug costs for many people, correct? That was the sixth trend you, you shared. That's exactly right. So CMS um, did many things. So one is it allowed itself to negotiate with drug manufacturers to lower the cost of certain drugs. Other things have been in place for quite a while and CMS continues to expand that accessibility. So for example, we saw lots of reduction in the cost of drugs for people with diabetes. So we see that those drugs are capped at $35, which is much more affordable than those drugs have historically been. And then for people that have really high out-of-pocket costs, CMS has capped their out-of-pocket costs at $2,000. And importantly, it's given them an opportunity to pay that $2,000 over time. That's a really important improvement in how people are going to be able to afford their drugs, especially if they normally have very high out-of-pocket costs because of their condition. Is there a place people can go to, Anna, to learn more about the work you and, and your team are doing? So... People can actually look at all of these changes um, and how they're going to be affected by the changes to their health plan benefits. First, they're going to receive all of those plan documents in the mail, or if they've selected another way to receive them. Let's say, for example, they've said, I would like the, to receive this via email, or I'll go to the portal to look at that. October 1 is when CMS, and I mentioned before October 1 for existing plan members, but they can also go to medicare.gov and they can put in their zip code and they can actually compare their plan against everybody else in their service area. They can put their drugs in and the system will actually tell them, hear what your anticipated costs are going to be. Now, like I was mentioning earlier, costs are not the only thing to be thinking about. You wanna think about how you use healthcare, what are your preferences, what are your needs, whether that health plan is geared towards your specific conditions. There are many health plans, for example, that are special needs plans for people with diabetes, for people with cardiovascular disease, for people with respiratory conditions. So those are important considerations as well because those plans have layered on additional services and specialty networks and drugs in the formulary, community type interactions that are set up to serve these people optimally that have these conditions. So all of those things are really important to look at. And Lawrence. Tell everyone what they should know about how to become part of Get Set Up and how Get Set Up will be sharing more information about all of this. Oh, sure. I'd, it would, I'd be happy to, right? So so anyone can come to um, www.getsetup.com. Um, you'll see that uh, between now and October 1st, we'll be rolling out more and more Medicare education educational content. We have lots of other fun and entertaining content there as well, but uh, specific to the today's topic, we're talking about the um, the importance of, of of healthcare and understanding your health options. 
And so we will have a fairly significant Medicare education hub that we'll be rolling out for, for Q4 to help older adults uh, learn how to use websites like uh, cms.gov uh, that Anna just described and, and how to browse it and how to uh, find answers to your questions, uh, what you need to know about Part A and Part B and Part C and Part D and what they really mean, um, classes on how to read your annual notice of change and, and, and how to take advantage of your benefits and do you have certain benefits? These are all really interesting things that that people need to know. We need to know in order to get the most out of our out of our healthcare. So um, these changes are important for for get set up to watch because it allows us to create programming specific to addressing um, the things that people will want and need to learn about to to, to better use their healthcare. Really, really so important. Uh, thank you, Lawrence and Anna, for for taking time with us today and for the work that you're doing. We want to thank our sponsor for this episode, Get Set Up, empowering older adults by providing them with the skills, opportunities, confidence, and connections to lead fulfilling and healthy lives. The fastest growing learning and discovery platform with more than 5,000 areas of interest. And thanks to all of you for watching or listening. Remember, you can always find us at maryfurlong.com slash podcast.